My name is Nicole Savia. I am the permanent representative of the International Association of Democratic Lawyers to the United Nations here in Geneva. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this side event at the 48th session of the Human Rights Council entitled Living in Fear, Daily Abuses and Intimidation in the South Hebronese. This event is co-organized co by the Italian Association of Democratic Lawyers, L'Associazione Papa Giovanni XXIII, Operazione Colomba and COSPE, as a part of a bigger project called Land Right, Path of Social Economy and Solidarity in Palestine, financed by the Italian Agency for Development Corporation, Cooperation. I will try to speak slowly and I kindly ask all other speakers to do the same in order to facilitate the work of the interpreters, since this event is simultaneously live streamed in English, Italian and Arabic. The South Hebron Hills in, is the southernmost part of the West Bank and include approximately 122 Palestinian communities, which together house close to 70 70,000 people, as well as roughly 8,500 Israeli settlers who live in illegal settlements and outposts. In this region, the Palestinian population earns its living primarily from agricultural work and sheep herding. Some are refugees who arrived in the West Bank after their expulsion in 1948 or afterwards, while others are descendants of families who have been living in the area for hundreds of years. The region of the South Hebron Hills is in the so-called Area C of the West Bank under full Israeli control. The, the establishment and expansion of illegal Israeli settlements and outposts, the creation of firing zones, military laws, settlers' violence, home evictions, demolition of houses, agricultural buildings, roads, and other vital infrastructures, the systematic denial of construction permits for Palestinians, lack of access to land, water, and electricity, military harassment and aggression, checkpoints, closures, institutionalized policy of discrimination, arbitrary detention, and many other serious violations of international law have a terrible impact on the lives of Palestinian people living in the hills. The state of Israel, the occupying power, and its armed forces has never been held accountable for their crimes. And as we all know, most Israeli crimes against the Palestinian population may well amount to war crimes and crimes against humanity that should be investigated and prosecuted not only by the International Criminal Court, but also by the national courts of each country. In today's event, we will talk about daily life in the South Hebron Hills, about children who must be escorted in their way to schools by armed soldiers and human rights activists, because otherwise they would be violently attacked by settlers, about farmers who have no safe access to their land. But we will, we will also speak about non-violent resistance movement, about international law, and above all, above all, about the urgent need to ensure accountability for all these violations. Our first speaker is Samiha Ureini. Samiha is a young woman and a human rights activist from the village of al Tuwan in the South Hebron Hills. She is the co-founder, along with her brother Sami Ureini, of the Youth of Sumud Movement, a non-violent resistance movement of young Palestinians bravely standing up against the military occupation of Palestine. Welcome, Samiha. Thank you very much for being with us today. The floor is yours. You have 10 minutes, please. Oh, hi, everyone. I'm Hamrini. I'm a volunteer with the group of Youth of Sumud in the area of South Hebron Health in Kata Yatta um, as a human rights defender volunteer. Uh, I want just to say a general term about the area of South Hebron Health. Uh, it's in the south of West Bank. Uh, uh, Education against the Palestinian rights. There's bad internet connection, I think. Yeah. 
Hello? I think there's some problem with our connection. Let's see if we can solve it quickly. Otherwise, we can pass to our next speaker and we come back to Samisha later on. Samisha, do, do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Ah, okay, yes. No, we had some, uh, the, the connection was cut. Please go ahead. Yeah, can you hear me clear now? Yes, yes, very well. Yeah, I will uh, just keep going about our daily life as a Palestinian people living uh, in between the settlements under the Israeli occupation operation. Uh, let me speak about uh, our simple rights uh, as a human being all over the world. Uh, education, our right in education that's violated daily by the Israeli occupation army and settlers. One uh, simple example that the school children that they have to pass through the settlement to reach their school from Tuba village to Twani village where I live, that we have this also uh, simple school that we don't have in all of the South Hebron. Uh, and it's not uh, really a very big uh, school, but at the same time, it's under, uh, you know, threat to be demolishing any moment. It was already demolished for a couple of time, and in any moment, it's under to be demolishing. Our uh, right to have houses, that is uh, the, also one of the simple rights that uh, all the human beings have to have in all over the world. That when you are like when you are living in your home, it's not feeling safe to because it's under threat to be uh, demolition. Uh, the fear that we are speaking about uh, today, that we are uh, living in fear that's entering in every single detail in our daily life as a Palestinian people in the area of South Hebron House. When you are, when you are speaking uh, about uh, being in your house and having night rays uh, during your uh, sleeping in your bedroom, it means the fear is entering inside also your uh, bedroom, in your uh, peace house, we can say. We are living close to settlements and are said to be attacked by the settlers in any moment. Uh, you are speaking about the fear that's entering in, in your mind, not about yourself, because it's not like you're not worried about yourself because you broke the borders of fear as a Palestinian people uh, and activists, but you are worried about your mind, I mean, your family, uh, your land, your trees that you are planting and being uh, cutting uh, up uh, in any moment by the extremist settlers because they are using the ethnic cleansing against the Palestinian people in that area. We as a Palestinian living the apartheid regime daily life in Palestinian, uh, as a Palestinian people in the area. At the same time, you are facing the uh, ethnic cleansing against your uh, human being in that area. There is a, the Palestinian people here living in caves and tents and shelters because they are not allowed to build in a normal house all over the people in all this world because uh, they, they have to leave this area and, uh, because they want to uh, store the land and building more settlements. So uh, the fear that we are speaking about, the word of the, of the fear itself, it's a very big word and can hold a different feeling of the human uh, being. But here as a Palestinian, we are facing it directly from the occupation that, as I mentioned before, entering in your single details of your uh, daily life. Uh, when you have, uh, for example, I will mention more the women rules that they are uh, always worried and feeling fear about uh, her children that she sends them uh, during the through the settlements and every morning and every afternoon and she's not sure if you will back safe as all over the children in this world. The violation of the human rights here is really entering in you feel that uh, there's no rights in this world because our rights as Palestinian is really violated. As a, as a Yusuf Samud uh, right defender that we used to fight in the, in the peaceful in the peaceful resistance and following and document the attack that's happening daily in the in, in the area of South Hebron House, the demolition that's happening at least weekly in in the area of South Hebron House, the the attack of the settlers that's happening against the shepherds, the, the night raids, the day raids, the red food that happening uh, in the area, the shooting, that the direct shooting that the army used to shoot uh, for the Palestinian people who is living in that area. All these crimes that's happening against the Palestinian people is to make them uh, leaving the area and stop them having normal life as all over the world. 
So uh, when we want to mention the fear, we are mentioning it in our daily life as a Palestinian woman or old man or children. They don't care about all these things. As a, and me as an activist, I uh, belong to a family who have a long history in the nonviolent resistance. And my family has been targeted by the Israeli occupation, even my settlers, even my dad, even my uh, even my brother, sorry, or my dad, my brothers that have been uh, arrested for double the time, my house that have been uh, raided in the night and then the during the day just to be, uh, for my brothers to be arrested because they are just normal activists and uh, looking uh, for the peace, even just in our single details uh, of our daily life. We are following our uh, our freedom. Really, our freedom even just to have a normal day without any facing any violence by the settlers or army. The fear that is entering in if you have just decide to go to, to your bed to, to sleep, it's entering that you are worried in any moment your house being uh, raided or your home, you wake up that you have a demolition order, uh, a checkpoint that uh, really harassment your freedom of movement or access to your land. Uh, for like your right to education, all this right is violated daily by this uh, Israeli occupation army and settlers. But in the same time, we have to talk uh, really this uh, this borders of fear that uh, we should that we already broke. But in the same time, as I mentioned before, that you are worried uh, 24 hour about the, your mind things that uh, really uh, make you. You don't feel peace around you anywhere, even in your, uh, even in your home or in your uh, own house. And uh, yeah, I, I was just mentioning. Thank you very much, Samiha, for sharing your personal and working experience with us and for being so brave. Uh, I thank you very much for the hard work you are doing on the ground. You can count on all our support and solidarity. We now turn to our next speaker, who is uh, Bajat El Helu. El Sorry if I mispronounce your name. Head of Public Awareness and Training Unit at the Independent Commission for Human Rights, where he worked since 2007. He's based in Gaza. Welcome, Bajat. Thank you very much for being with us. The floor is yours. You have 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Actually, I'm going to uh, uh, focus on the most important um, punitive international mechanisms to bring justice to, uh, to, south, uh, uh, to, to the South Hebron Hills. Uh, the ongoing prolonged Israeli occupation of Palestine remains the main hinder of the state of Palestine to safeguard the basic rights of Palestinian citizens, in particular, the right to of dignity and adequate standard of living. Uh, the practices and policies of the Israeli occupation weaken the capacity of the Palestinian duty, duty bearers to fulfill their legal obligations in the South Hebron Hills, which is under the full Israeli control in Area C of the West Bank. The Israeli occupation con, con, uh, con, uh, constructs settlements, practices, settler implantation, and prevents the access of the Palestinian Authority to the Southern Hebron Hills to provide its citizens with their basic needs. Uh, based on this horrible background and as a state party, Palestine can resort to the ICC to bring justice to its citizens and to bring bring Israeli perpetrators of the crimes to justice. Uh, what is the relation between Palestine and the ICC? Uh, actually, on the 22nd of January 2009, the Palestinian National Authority lodged a declaration under Article 12.3 of the Court Statute, which is um, known by Rome Statute, recognizing the ICC's jurisdiction. Consequently, the Office of the Prosecutor initiated a preliminary examination in order to determine whether there was a reasonable basis to proceed with an investigation. In April 2012, prosecutor concluded that the status of Palestine in the UN as an observer entity was determinative. 
and Palestine could not sign or ratify the Rome Statute at that time, nor could it lodge an Article 12 treaty. But on the 29th of November 2012, Palestine, Palestine legal status was elevated to a non-member observer state. Accordingly, Palestine now could ratify human rights treaties and become a recognized state party without any restrictions or limitations. Uh, Palestine uh, has been fully exercising its rights, its rights as a state party. For instance, Palestine representatives attend meetings of the assembly of state parties, voted on all issues, including inter alia the election of the court's judges. Palestine has been adhering now to the statute obligations. On the 1st of January 2015, the state of Palestine lodged declaration pursuant to Article 12.3, accepting the court's jurisdiction over alleged crimes committed in the occupied Palestinian territory, including East Jerusalem, since June 13, 2014. At that time, if you remember, war in Gaza and, and West Bank as well. On 16 of January 2015, the Office of the Prosecutor started a preliminary investigation, and on the 22nd of May 2018, Palestine submitted to the prosecutor a referral of the situation in Palestine pursuant to Article 13A and 14. The letter of referral, referral requested the prosecutor to investigate past, ongoing, and the future crimes within the court's jurisdiction committed in all parts of the territory of the state of Palestine. Such referral did not automatically lead to the opening of an, of an investigation, since the, pro the prosecutor herself still had to determine whether the statutory criteria to open an investigation were met. On December 2019, the prosecutor announced that Following a thorough, independent, and objective assessment of the reliable information available to her office, the preliminary examination into the situation in Palestine had concluded with a determination that all the statutory criteria under Article 53.1 of the Rome Statute for the opening of an, investi of an investigation had been met. The prosecutor announced that there that she was satisfied that, number one, there was a reasonable basis to believe that war crimes have been or are being committed in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem and Gaza Strip. Two, potentially cases arising from the situation would be admissible. Three, there were no sustainable reasons to believe that an investigation would not serve the interests of justice. Uh, the, in the prosecutor's request uh, in January 2020, two years ago, the office set out its legal position but encouraged the chamber to hear views and arguments from all stakeholders before deciding the specific jurisdictional question before it. The chamber did so and heard all points of view. And finally, on the, five, on the 5th of February 2001, the chamber decided by a majority that the court may exercise its criminal jurisdiction in the situation in Palestine, and the territorial scope of this jurisdiction extends to Gaza and the West Bank, including East Jerusalem. The chamber decided in a majority that Palestine is a state party to the Rome Statute. The majority also ruled that Palestine's referral of the situation obliged the office to open an investigation. On the 5th of March 2021, prosecutor of the ICC, Madame Fatou bin Souda, confirmed the initiation of an investigation respecting the situation in Palestine. The investigation will cover the crimes within the jurisdiction of the court that are alleged to have been committed in the situation since 13th of June 2014, the date to which reference is, is made in the referral of the situation to the office of the prosecutor. Now, the, quest, the main question is why the ICC? 
The ICC is the basic international justice body responsible for holding those who perpetrated grave breaches to Geneva Conventions accountable. The court is the fundamental international punitive mechanism to all crimes against the rules of the international humanitarian law. The Rome Statute established, established four core international crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes as types of violations that Samiha mentioned, for example, are considered war crimes, and the crime of aggression. Those crimes shall not be subject to any statute of limitations. The crimes perpetrated by the Israeli occupation forces in, in south, the South Hebron Hills that belong to the state of Palestine, which is a state on the territory of which the crimes, the crime in question occurred. Consequently, the court can exercise its jurisdiction. The crimes conducted by both the Israeli occupation forces and the Israeli settlers are war crimes under the, the, the jurisdiction of the court. Article 8 clarifies that when it stipulates that statute considers the following conduct as a war crime under the court jurisdiction. The transfer directly or indirectly by the occupying power, this is what Rome Statute stipulates in Article 8. The transfer directly or indirectly by the occupying power of part of its own civilian population into the territory it occupies or the deportation or transfer of all or part of the population of the occupied territory within or outside this territory is considered a war crime. In addition, the Israeli settlement did amount to war crime as Mr. Michael Lane concluded in his report before the Human Rights Council on the 9th, the 9th of July, 2020. We conclude that the Israeli crimes in the South Hebron Hills, especially the violence practiced by the settlers against the civilians of the South Hebron Hills and their properties constitutes a war crime that requires accountability of the leaders and officials of the Israeli occupation. The state of Palestine should raise the issue of settlements as a continuing war crime that falls under the jurisdiction of the court. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bajat. Thank you for uh, uh, your, your important uh, contribution and for, the, for raising the crucial issue of accountability and also for stressing the important role of the International Criminal Court. Indeed, the open investigation by the ICC is a great source of hope for, for, for all of us. Uh, within the occupied Palestinian territories, justice is substantially denied uh, to Palestinians. In this regard, our next speaker, Luigi Daniele, senior lecturer at Nottingham Law School, who is teaching and researching <clears throat> in international humanitarian law and international criminal law, will provide us with some detailed information about the military justice system imposed on Palestinian people, one of the core features of the Israeli occupation. As we will hear, the impact of this unjust judicial system is far-reaching and profoundly discriminatory. Good afternoon, Luigi. Thank you very much for being with us. The floor is yours, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me and see me all right? Yes, very well. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thanks for the invitation. Good afternoon, uh, Samia, Mikol, Bajat, and Professor Link. Uh, thanks sincerely to the organized uh, for the much appreciated chance of discussion, in particular for the possibility of discussing with grassroots activists, practitioners, uh, and absolute points of reference institutionally, like Professor Link. I'd like to briefly touch upon um, an aspect of the Israeli occupation, which, as Mikal was saying, I think dramatically impacts the life of the residents of the Hebron area and of the West Bank overall considered. 
uh, in my humble opinion, this aspect has not received yet the scholarly, legal, and institutional attention it deserves. I'm, of course, talking about the Israeli military justice system. Given the time constraints, I'll only try to synthesize few peculiar and, in my view, extremely concerning aspects of this system from the point of view of its combat compatibility with international legal standards. Um, my first reference is to the peculiar concentration of legislative, executive, and judicial powers uh, over the Palestinians in the end of the Israeli military itself, uh, considering uh, that the legislative um, norms sustaining this justice system lost their only reference to international humanitarian law already a few months after the entry into force of these military courts of occupation in 1967. Since then, no reference to international law, and in particular to international humanitarian law, has ever been made in the uh, more than 2,500 military orders that have constituted the uh, subsequent amendments of this original military order. So why I'm talking about concentration of um, all the powers over the Palestinians in the hand of the military? Well, because firstly, the Israeli Defense Forces Area Commander has super. as well as uh, imagine in particular that in the case of administrative detentions we uh, talk about preter delictum measures so measures adopted advance of any commission of any offense um, in which uh, no formal charge is issued against the suspect, and often no evidence at all is disclosed in the hearings before the military courts, given the security matters. Uh, so administrative detainees are from the outset denied the rights to which defendants in criminal proceedings are normally entitled. Uh, they do not know when they will be released. Uh, different NGOs have taught the of a form of psychological torture, torture in this continued cycle of uncertainty of the detainee. Uh, and imagine there is no restriction on the length of time of their detention because the, the orders uh, uh, imposing the administrative detention, even if have a, a duration of six months, can be renewable sine die, without a limit. Um, in sum, the Israeli military uh, exercise absolute powers over Palestinians, accumulating legislative, executive, and judiciary in the same hands. Imagine also, uh, we all know that after the report of Human Rights Watch, um, there was finally uh, um, a wide scholarly debate over the issue of apartheid. Imagine that this military justice system, in open rejection of the principle of territoriality of criminal law, uh, since the early 80s, uh, have 
has prosecuted Israeli nationals, residents, and settlers only under Israeli domestic law before Israeli courts, while Palestinians have been subject, of course, to the jurisdiction of the military courts. This policy of dual justice has installed a structure of legal and jurisdictional discrimination based on nationality, of which I'll try to give you uh, some very synthetic uh, elucidative examples. Striking difference uh, um, exemplified by, for example, maximum period of detention before being brought to a judge, 24 hours in Israeli domestic law compared with eight, eight days under the military courts of occupation. Maximum period of detention without access to lawyer, 48 hours under Israeli domestic law compared with 90 days under the military orders. Uh, maximum period of detention without charge, 30 days under Israeli domestic law in exceptional, in exceptional circumstances compared with potentially unlimited imprisonment under renewable administrative detention orders without the charge of a crime. Uh, another concerning example of discrimination, the treatment of minors. Under Israeli criminal law, a minor is a person who has not yet turned 18. Uh, military Order 1654, written in 2009, established the separate military court for Palestinian children and ended, imagine, 42 years of trying children as young as 12 years of age in the same military courts as adult Palestinians. But still, even after this amendment, a 16 years old Palestinian under these orders is still considered a young adult. Now, I'm talking about, of course, normative differences, but the legal discrimination are compounded by the discriminatory judicial administration and law enforcement policies and practices. Imagine organization analyzing the issue of the denunciation of settlers' offenses, um, such as Yeshdin, report that 85.3% of the investigation files are closed due to the failure by police investigators to locate suspects or to collect sufficient evidence to support indictments. Just 7.4% 7 of the investigations yielded indictments against su suspects, and just in one third of these legal proceedings uh, ended in a full or partial conviction. Uh, the likelihood that, that, that a complaint submitted to the Israeli police by a Palestinian will lead to conviction of the suspect is, is just 1.8%. In contrast, and this is probably the most significant uh, empirical element of those who are charged in the military court system, approximately 90 to 95% are convicted with some yearly records uh, arriving at 99.73%. Of convictions of those charged. Uh, these data comfort me in concluding that in this model of dual justice we can see an out-and-out -out system of legal apartheid institutionally upheld. Um, imagine that NGOs averagely estimate that more than 800,000 detainees from 1967 uh, have in one way or another spent weeks or years in Israeli prisons. And I go quickly toward the conclusion, this indicates a policy of mass incarceration and raises the question of the connection between this policy and the substantive law enforced by the military courts. Uh, even here, very few elucidative examples. Uh, imagine Article 215 of the Security Provision Order uh, imposes one year of imprisonment to whoever Palestinian insults a soldier or in any other act offend his honor or behaves in an insulting manner toward one of the IDF authorities and also just symbols. So there is, in other words, an imposition on Palestinians almost of a form of symbolic loyalty and respect for their occupiers. 
even more concerningly, uh, long sentences are imposed to those who support or express sympathy for an unlawful organization, which in Israeli legislation includes the Palestinian Liberation Organization. So many components of the Palestinian Legislative Council are technically have been affiliated to, a, to an unlawful organization. Look then at this norm, Article 251. Whoever attempts orally or otherwise to influence public opinion in the area, which is the best West Bank, in a manner which may harm public peace or public order, or carries out an expressing identification with a hostile organization, like waving a flag, displaying a symbol or a slogan, or playing an anthem, or voicing a slogan, or any similar explicit action expressing identification or sympathy in a public place or in a manner uh, allowing people to see or hear such expression shall be sentenced to 10 years imprisonment okay so criminalization of expression also overcoming the fundamental principle of personality of the criminal liability. There are articles uh, uh, stating that, for example, Article 231, a member of a group in which one or more of its members, meaning other members, uh, uh, commit or committed while members of the group an offense under Section 230, carrying weapons substantially, shall be sentenced to life imprisonment. This means that uh, irrespective of the knowledge of another member of the group, someone can be uh, uh, sentenced for the behavior of another person, okay? Even if he or she didn't know anything about this behavior. And this is particularly striking in terms of collision with the fundamental guarantees of the legal system governed, governed by uh, the rule of law. Um, I've just tried to synthesize a few examples, but you can understand that the military courts apply an utterly authoritarian model of justice, which not only uh, obstructs the Palestinian human right to justice in their daily life, but also criminalizes their peaceful ways of expressing or at least claiming their right to self-determination. So um, it, it is said that this legislation is um, envisaged to protect Israeli security, but it seems to me that it is only aimed at retaining permanent territorial control over the West Bank. So this court of occupation are in reality working as court of illegal annexation. Um, the last thing I tell you, and then uh, I will uh, shut up in order to let Professor Link um, intervene, as, as the activists uh, today can testify, this legislation, strongly authoritarian, doesn't work in isolation. Um, we have uh, a system of permits and of criminalization of simply wandering in certain areas or uh, staying in the proximity of military areas that brings Palestinians to be uh, convicted for violating this special permit regime every year. Now, in particular, considering uh, a territory with 98 internal and border checkpoints, 76 roadblocks, 124 road gates, 60 kilometers of barriers, 24 kilometers of trenches. These are data of the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs of the UN. You can imagine what does it mean uh, to be uh, threatened of 10 year imprisonment for entering restricting areas. In sum, and I conclude, this legislation renders every Palestinian under occupation a potential criminal. And what I hope is that we all mobilize for an expansion of the scope of the investigation of the Office of the Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court to include uh, inquiries over the potential commission of the war crime of willfully depriving protected person of 
the rights to fair and regular trial within the military justice system, which, as I said, is working as a tool of progressive annexation. I, I hope that the presence of the Special Rapporteur today uh, will, will bring to an attention uh, for this justice system for the simple reason that we cannot declare a project uh, that of colonial annexation to be unlawful and then uh, uh, avoid sanctioning the form of institutionalized violence used to realize and protect this very unlawful project. So thank you very much to everyone. Thank you so much, Luigi, for your clear and exhaustive uh, contribution and uh, for calling the attention on the legal apartheid that adds up uh, to the countless other forms of discrimination suffered by Palestinians. Thank you very much also for em emphasizing the need to denounce this unjust military justice system and to advocate for the extension of the scope of the ICC investigation as to include scrutiny over crime committed in this context. Thank you very much, Luigi. At last but not least, we will hear from Professor Michael Link, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights Situation in the Occupied Palestinian Territories. Professor Link has a long academic career and also a vast working experience in the field. Since he was appointed Special Rapporteur in 2016, despite the systematic lack of cooperation by Israel and the enormous pressure existing on its mandate, he has been tirelessly documenting and reporting about all human rights violations committed in the OPT, urging the international community to assume its legal responsibility to countering those, these violations and to end the illegal occupation of Palestine in accordance with international law. Professor Ling, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. The floor is yours. Cool. Thank you very much for that introduction. Thank you for the invitation to speak as part of this panel <clears throat> on human rights abuses in the South Hebron Hills, and my thanks to Sonia, Bajat, and Luigi for their wonderful presentations. This event is highlighting an important, if shamefully underreported, pattern of dispossession and annexation that is occurring largely below the political radar. I know the South Hebron Hills well. Many years ago, during the first, first Palestinian Intifada, I worked for the UN on a human rights role, work which took me all over the West Bank. On a regular basis, I would travel to Hebron and the Fahwar refugee camp. This work would also take me to Yatta and the hills around it. Here in my home in Eastern uh, uh, Canada, there's a beautiful red woolen rug on the floor beside me from the village of Tawani. Last week, the Israeli liberal daily Haratz ran a very moving article by Gideon Levy and Alex Levesque about an elderly Palestinian farming family in the South Hebron Hills, living right next door to the illegal Israeli settlement of Abigail. I urge you all to read it if you can. It paints a stark picture, as stark a picture as we can imagine, uh, about the apartheid-like living conditions faced by Palestinians living in the South Hebron Hills. The Hamamdi family, have to truck in all of their drinking and agricultural water. That is when the Israeli army allows them to do so. Frequently, the army stops them and confiscates the water. The water that they buy costs them around $300 American every month. But Abigail, the Israeli settlement next to them, is hooked up to the Israeli national water system and has unlimited access to both cheap water and to the electrical power. Several weeks ago, an Israeli human rights organization, Combatants for Peace, attempted to bring water to the Hamamdi family as a solidarity gesture. Without any apparent provocation, the Israeli army fired st stun grenades and tear gas at them to stop the delivery. In another example of solidarity, the Hamamdi family receives its power from solar panels that have been supplied by the European NGO Comet EM which provides panels to Palestinian communities that Israel does not allow to hook up to the national electric, electrical power grid. This solidarity is welcomed and it is important, but is unlikely to be enough to protect the Hamamdis and the 300,000 other Palestinians living in so-called Area C of the West Bank. 
Area C, which makes up about 60% of the West Bank, was created by the Oslo Accords and is supposed to expire by 1999 with the independence of Palestine. Like many other features of this occupation, this temporary arrangement has a strong smell of permanence to it. Let me highlight three trends that are ongoing in the South Hebron Hills. These trends epitomize the present reality and the future direction of this forever occupation. First, what is going on in the South Hebron Hills is a sharp illustration of Israel's quest to de facto annex what remains of Palestine. Israeli political leaders do not hide their ambition to, form, to extend formal Israeli de jure sovereignty over much of the West Bank, leaving behind, in their eyes, a moth-eaten Palestinian statelet as its vision of a two-state solution. The South Hebron Hills are part of the annex, annexation plans of virtually every Israeli political leader who advocates for a greater Israel. To achieve this means an ongoing Israeli strategy of more land and fewer Palestinians. In the South Hebron Hills, this means confiscating Palestinian land to enable the establishment and growth of Israeli settlements, the creation of military firing and, and weapon testing zones, and the prohibition of housing permits for Palestinians to be able to expand their homes or to build new homes. This means the toleration or encouragement by the Israeli army of unremitting settler violence against Palestinian farmers and shepherds and landowners. It means making access to water and electrical power by Palestinians difficult, if not impossible. Ultimately, it means maintaining a coercive environment that reminds Palestinians that they are a subjected people, that they have vastly inferior legal and political rights to the inhabitants of the illegal settlements around them, and that what rights they do have will not be respected and will have no means of being reinforced. The second trend that I wish to highlight that this occupation is governed by international law, particularly the international human rights law, humanitarian law, and criminal law. The international community created these hard-won laws over the past 75 years, and they are meant to apply equally without fear and without favor, including to the occupation of Palestine. What is going on in the South Hebron Hills is entirely illegal under international law. Let me summarize what these violations are. As an occupying power, Israel is strictly forbidden from annexing any territory. Both the de facto and the de jure annexation of territory are equally forbidden under international law. The Israeli settlements are not only a flagrant violation of the Fourth Geneva Convention, but they are now a presumptive war crime under the 1998 Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. The forced displacement of, of a protected people under occupation violates strict protections under the Fourth Geneva Convention and may well amount to a war crime under the Rome Statute. And the creation and entrenchment of a vastly different two-tier system of political, social, and legal rights between the protected people and those in, set in the settlements may well amount to the crime of apartheid. The whole point of the laws of occupation are to prevent an inquisitive occupying power like Israel from realizing illegitimate territorial ambitions and to preserve the territory of the protected people, in this case, the Palestinians, in order that they may be able to rule themselves as a free people. And the third and last trend that I want to emphasize is that of international accountability. There is no occupation in the modern world that has been conducted with the international community so alert to the many grave breaches of international law, so knowledgeable about the occupier's obvious and well-signaled intention to annex and establish permanent sovereignty so well informed about the scale of suffering and dispossession endured by the protected people under occupation, and yet so unwilling to act upon the overwhelming evidence before it to employ the tangible and plentiful legal and political tools at its disposal to end this injustice. 
an international community that took its legal responsibilities to challenge and to end internationally wrongful acts would have long ago concluded that Israel, the occupying power, was not sincere about seeking to end the occupation. It would understand from varying examples, such as what is going on in the South Hebron Hills, that muffled protests and meek criticisms are not changing the harsh reality on the ground. It would draw the necessary lessons from the many unfulfilled Security Council and General Assembly and Human Rights Council resolutions, the inordinate length of the occupation, the innumerable facts on the ground, and the aimless rounds of negotiations. Such an international community would take the prudent and necessary steps to collectively construct a list of effective countermeasures which would be appropriate and proportional to the circumstances. The international community would realize that bold measures and determination to enforce accountability in these circumstances would greatly improve the chances that the next obstinate occupier would not likely want to test its resolve. All of this tells us that accountability must rise to the very top of the international political agenda respecting the illegal Israeli occupation of Palestine. Let me conclude with assuring the people of the South Hebron Hills and those valiant human rights defenders, Palestinians, Israelis, and internationals who work tirelessly on their behalf that there are many of us in the UN human, international human rights system who understand their struggle for dignity, for equality, for freedom. Realizing your human rights is in all of our best interests. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Link, for your comprehensive and inspiring uh, remarks and for all the work you are doing at the Human Rights Council and the General Assembly. It's such a relief to know that uh, within the UN system there are indeed many people as you who understand and support the Palestinian struggle. And to the Palestinian um, people also go all our support and active solidarity. Now we are uh, almost running out of time. We have time just for one question that was in the, my colleagues sent me that was in the social networks where the, the event is live streamed. And uh, it's for Samiha. Uh, the, uh, the question is, which is the main aim of youth of some Sum, uh, Sumud activist group and why you decide to start this group? Please, Samiha. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, as I introduce myself before, the member of the uh, Sumud group, youth of Sumud group is uh, uh, a group in the two gender, male and female, we are all lost, uh, the old one of us is 20. We with people to be part of it, and um, uh, so uh, we start our different uh, daily activity on the ground uh, as a human rights defender uh, to defend our human rights uh, as a Palestinian people living in South Sudan, as I mentioned also before, that is uh, uh, violated by the uh, Israeli uh, so we see a company of children, company of school children that we have to pass daily from the outposts uh, of Habat Maon, and the document all the violations that's happening against our rights as a Palestinian in the area of South Sudan. Uh, and then we start to preserve the idea more and uh, uh, ask for more land in all over the West Bank, the places where we can reach through our relation uh, with other Palestinian activists and international activists. And uh, we start uh, to speak more and more about the um, experience of the Sumud. We spend uh, in the village of Sarira around four years of restoring the caves. 
because the Palestinian people used to live in caves and uh, in bad villages, uh, restored the land, plant more trees, uh, restored the stone wall that was already demolished by the Israeli settlers. Uh, because they were trying to delete any Palestinian identity where before in that village because they want to use it as an Israeli land and they want to use it more to build the settlements for the settlers. So we try uh, to work hard in this village to back it as it was before and make it able to be living because as we all know, we are living now in 2021 and there is a people in, in Palestine living, still living in caves and tents because they are fighting for their rights and they are uh, really looking for justice in this life because they are just living in such places to protect their land by to be stolen by the extremist settlers and the illegal outposts that's uh, building in our uh, land as a Palestinian people. Uh, so uh, we feel the responsibility as a young people living in South Eastern Hills to lead and continue the different activity that the old people used to do before of us. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, I was living, uh, living in Islamic village uh, at the moment that uh, at least have a master plan, we have a road, we have a school, we have electricity, we have water. After a long time of uh, resist this situation to get all these uh, simple services for my village, but the other villages don't have it. Uh, and we try to support the other village as much as we can from uh, the electricity or water, but it's always being cut in and stopped by the Israeli uh, army in that area and our old people like for example my grandma my father and other uh, people in the village used to resist until this moment a lot of them being attacked arrested and having uh, you know being old uh, in the age so we feel more that's our responsibility as a young people because israel have this sentence that the old people is gonna die the young people is gonna forget the new generation and know nothing and it will be easier for them to, uh, you know, uh, occupy uh, Palestine. But this is what we are also fight this sentence that we are here and we as young people are learning and we will keep uh, leading the resistance that the old people before of us used to lead. And uh, that we are here and building a new mind and we will uh, we are really believing in our rights, uh, even if violated, uh, if we by the Israeli settlers and army. So uh, Yusuf Samud was born uh, by a group of youth people believed in the non-violent resistance, believed that one day Palestine will be free, believe in our rights, and we want to defend this until the end. Thank you very much, uh, Samia. Uh, we still have, they send me another question that is for all uh, panelists, but we have just a few minutes so we cannot really enter into details. The question is the policy of settlements, colonization and closures by Israel authorities in Palestine can be formally defined as ethnic cleansing according to the international humanitarian law. Is there anyone that want to speak out on this issue. Luigi, Michael Link. Yeah, well, Ajat. Just, just a flash, what I wouldn't see of the ethnic cleansing uh, is the, uh, let's say, manifest intention to, uh, let's say, eliminate uh, physically uh, people, but I would see some ideologic, ideological root that is also in the background of this legal figure. So probably if I were a prosecutor, I wouldn't try to configure this crime, but I would read and study this crime to see uh, if there are like background policies also aimed at eliminating Palestinians from certain areas. Thank you very much. Any yes, other, please? Yes, in addition of uh, my colleague Luigi has just mentioned, also uh, uh, Article 8 of uh, the statute, the Rome statute, uh, answered these uh, questions and mentioned that it's uh, a war crime. It's, you know, ethnic cleansing that the transfer directly or indirectly by the occupying power of part of its own civilian population into the territory it occupies or the deportation or transfer of 
all or part of the population of the occupied territory within or outside this territory. So uh, what Israel is practicing, perpetrating, uh, is uh, considered war crime or war crimes, especially the, the issue of uh, 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 this, this crime of, of cleansing, uh, especially what is going on in East Jerusalem and in the South Hebron Hills. Thank you, Bajat. Uh, if there are no other uh, remarks, uh, it's three o'clock. So we can uh, close this meeting now. Once more, thank you very much to all distinguished panelists, to the interpreters, and to all those who have been working to organize this uh, side event to the 48th session of the Human Rights Council. Thank you very much for your attention. Have a good evening. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.